Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're getting enthusiastic about palatalization. That is to say, what the heck is going on with G and C. But first, thanks to everyone for your enthusiastic recommending during our November Recommendathon. Yes, thanks so much for all your tweets and posts and shares and all of the new people that you've brought in with you to listen to Lingthusiasm. We will be thanking every one of you who made some kind of public declaration about their love of Lingthusiasm, and we'll give you until the end of the month to add yourself to that esteemed group of people so we can thank you all in our annual anniversary post. Yes, so you have till the end of November 2018 to be part of this year's Recommendathon thank you post, which will live in perpetuity on our website. Last year we thanked 100 people, so this year I think we can thank even more. I'm really excited by what we've seen so far. I'm feeling very confident about that. And of course, you can continue to recommend us to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life any time of the year. I also want to thank everybody who came out to the live shows. Yay! I'm not going to lie, we're recording this before the live shows. So we're really hoping people actually come. Uh, So we are just going to have to assume that they were an absolute rolling success. We're recording well in advance at the moment to make sure that we have episodes for when Lauren's on leave. And we're very excited about those live shows. I assume they were great. Uh, Thanks so much to everyone who came out in Melbourne and Sydney. And it was so fun to get to see those cities. We also want to remind you that if you're thinking about getting a Lingthusiasm merch for any linguist or language enthusiast in your life, if you want to get someone a scarf with the International Phonetic Alphabet, or tree symbol diagrams on them, or a tie with the IPA on it, or various baby outfits, or t-shirts that say not judging your grammar, just analyzing it, or many other things, now is a great time to place an order so that it arrives in time for towards the end of the year. Remember, it's also totally okay to use this as a list of suggestions for other people to buy you, or if you enjoy doing a bit of holiday shopping for yourself, we're not going to stop you. And we definitely uh, noticed from last year that Redbubble typically runs some sales this time of year, so hopefully you can take advantage of those to uh, get you and or your friends and family some great Lingthusiasm swag. And speaking of the holiday season, it's very important holiday season coming up. That's the the Northern Hemisphere Winter Conference season, which I'm usually excited about, not doing so much travel this year. Well, the Australian Linguistic Society is also having its annual meeting in Adelaide in December, which I'm going to be at because I'm still in Australia. So our latest Patreon bonus episode is all about the academic conference circuit and how to make it work for you. I had a lot of fun in this episode. This is all of mine and Gretchen's favourite survival tips for navigating academic conferences. If you've never been to one before or you've only been to a couple, they're lots of fun and they can be even more fun. Yes. So you can go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm to check those out or lingthusiasm.com slash merch for the merch. We'll repeat those links at the end of the episode so you don't have to write them down now. So G and C are really weird letters because they're these two letters that in a whole bunch of languages often come with multiple sounds. You have the sounds in their names like J and S, and then you have other sounds like G and K, and then like even more sounds. What? These letters are so weird. I'm not known for being the most reliable when it comes to a spelling bee. And I feel like it's often letters like G and C that trip me up because they have so many different pronunciation disguises that they put on. They really do. And they especially do that in different languages. So we can do a brief sample of this through different languages' words for cheese. Oh, let's do a cross-linguistic cheese platter. (laughs) A cross-linguistic cheese tour. Excellent. So first we have the Latin casis, meaning cheese. And this gives rise to a whole bunch of other words for cheese in different languages. Uh, So you have English cheese, you have German käse, you have Spanish queso. Yep. Because I was like, well, in Italian you have formaggio, which is like a completely different historical word. But then I remembered that my favorite Italian pasta from Rome is cacio e pepe. And that's the Italian Latin word for cheese is still hidden in that very excellent pasta dish. And then because I started thinking about this, I was looking up other languages' words for cheese. 
and I saw the Dutch cars, mm. which I don't speak any Dutch, but there's one Dutch word that I know, which is pindakas. And pindakas literally translates as peanut cheese. Oh, oh, hang on, like peanut butter? Yeah. So the Dutch word for peanut butter is literally translated as peanut cheese, which at first seems like this is maybe an interesting dish. But then you're like, is peanut butter really any better as a, as a term for it? Because it's still like a dairy no, metaphor. Yeah, because I was like, it's a weird choice, but actually it, it's not that different. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that different at all. <laughs> Especially if you think of like a cream cheese, which is like a, you know, creamier, creamier cheese, maybe. Peanut butter is kind of creamy sometimes. I'm still going to eat it no matter what it's called, so. And then you have Irish kasha, which is also from Latin kasias. And kasias is spelled with a C and an S, and they're pronounced k and s. Yeah. But cheese takes that initial k and makes it ch. Queso and queso and cacho keep that initial ka sound at the beginning, but cacho changes the S into ch. Yeah. Dutch keeps it the way it was, and then Irish also changes the second one into kasha. So different languages have taken this one word that seemed like it had a fairly straightforward pronunciation and altered it in slightly different ways. I was trying to make a cheese metaphor about things like fermenting and going funky with age, but I guess this is why we're a <laughs> linguistics podcast and not a food podcast. <laughs> Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a food podcast about linguistics. <laughs> And this is all this weird stuff that C gets up to between different languages historically and in different languages in the modern era. And G does the same type of thing. If you were a kid, you might have learned about like hard G and soft G or hard C and soft C. I really struggle with the idea of hard C and soft C and hard G and soft G. So just to help other people who might as well, hard G is the like G sound and soft G is when it's used more like Z. Yes, or j, j or j, which is one of the reasons why this terminology is not generally linguist approved. Yeah, I just, um, like, I think about, for example, when I was chatting with Susie Stiles on the work we do about how we have this cross sensory idea, and hard and soft as a metaphor just don't work for me for those sounds. So, apologies if I leave Gretchen to do all of the explaining the difference between them today. <laughs> Well, I don't think I'm really going to use the terms either. I'm just going to mention the specific sound because you see when it happens cross-linguistically, there's a lot more going on than just that. But these are two letters that both have that hard-soft thing going on. We don't talk about like hard Q and soft Q or hard P and soft P. Yep. So like, why do these letters come in hard and soft versions, even if you can't remember which version is which? And to do this, we kind of need to also go back to the Romans. Yes. So there were simpler times back in <laughs> old Latin. The Latin alphabet comes from Greek, as a lot of people know, but this is one of the things that always puzzled me as a kid, because I was a kid who was into the Greek alphabet. I was like, look, the Greeks have this letter kappa, which stands for the K sound, and it looks like a K, and it's where we get the modern K. And they have this letter gamma, which is very clearly supposed to be a G. Who invented the C? Why is it there? And why does it cause me so much trouble? Yeah. And so it turns out that this is explained by the Etruscans, who were people that didn't make a distinction between the g sound and the k sound, like the sound in gamma and the sound in kappa. And they borrowed the Greek alphabet for their language, which we don't know very much about, but we know that they didn't care about the difference between gamma and kappa because they just borrowed one, which was gamma, and they used it for both because it didn't really matter for them. And then the Romans actually didn't initially borrow their alphabet from the Greeks, they borrowed it from the Etruscans. Because the Etruscans were living on the Italian peninsula, so they just borrowed it from the locals. Yeah, so they just borrowed it from the I locals. Do, I do love an ethically locally sourced alphabet, personally. <laughs> nice locally sourced alphabet. We have fragments of pottery from the Etruscans, but we don't know a whole lot about their language. But we know it wasn't Indo-European because all the Indo-European languages do distinguish between the gamma and the kappa sound. So the Romans borrow it from the Etruscans, and then they're left with like, oh, geez, we actually do want to make this distinction between these two sounds that we have, but the Etruscans don't have. And so someone invented the letter G. Like an actual person? Apparently. I mean, I'm quoting from Wikipedia. Do we know their name? Um, apparently his name was Spurius Cavalius Ruga, which definitely doesn't sound like a spurious name at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really spurious name. So he invented the letter G. Yeah. So at this point, the letter C was the third letter in the alphabet. 
still. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, look, we have this Kurt sound. K wasn't cool anymore as a, as a letter to represent K. They were all using the rounded, what we think of as C now. And he was like, mm, we need to make more of a distinction. And so apparently, there are people who disagree with this, but I like the story about young Spurious, um, <laughs> created the letter G and was like, this will do, like, now we can make the distinction again. And if you look at a capital G, it just looks like a C with like an extra stroke added onto it, right? Yeah. And so a gamma is like a right angle in the top left corner, and then you can curve it to make a C, and then you can add an extra stroke to make the G. So that's where the Romans got to. And he popped it in the alphabet in the seventh position, which is originally where a little Greek letter known as Zeta used to live. So is he responsible for the demotion of Zeta as well? Yeah, I mean, well, no, Z also wasn't cool anymore because the Romans didn't need it. So they never really borrowed it from the Greeks because, again, they got all their alphabet from the Etruscans. So the Romans weren't really oh, gotcha, down okay. with Zeta. They kind of had it there. He was like, well, let's just drop that letter out and we'll add this cool new G thing that I invented. So he kicked out Zeta and replaced it with G. Yeah. That's great. I love that. So, but the Romans, Latin actually pronounced, like, all of their C's and G's were K and G. Imagine doing a Latin spelling bee. It would be so great. It's I mean, I guess that's so why they easy. don't have spelling bees in most languages that have regular orthographies. Yeah, so easy. You know, so you have your classic Latin f phrase, weni, weedy, weeki, I came, I saw, I conquered. I like that you've used the original Latin pronunciation there, so you sound a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> And I had always pronounced this Veni Vidi Vici, but then I had a Latin teacher who told me, no, no, it's actually Weni Weedy Weeki, and that just sounds so foolish. Yes. <laughs> Every time I hear it. <laughs> so that Weeki is the C, what we think of a C being pronounced as K, as in yeah. the word for cheese. And then in late Latin, everything starts to go wrong. And by wrong, I mean great. For the empire as well as the language. Yeah, the empire was a bit messed up, but also the language started kind of fragmenting and became all these different versions. And in many of the different areas, people started pronouncing the, the C and the G in a different way sometimes. I love the sometimes bit. So we talk about like the environment that sounds are in can make them change, kind of adds a bit of like context. And that's that's really where the, the fun and the messiness of language can really play out when you have language changing over time. Yeah, so we need to talk about a particular area of the mouth, and this is the roof of your mouth. I'm touching it right now, but you can't see me, because <laughs> it's inside. <laughs> this is going to be a very if you, useful demonstration. If you have clean enough hands and you don't mind looking a bit ridiculous in public, you can turn the tip of your finger up to the ceiling and like press it into the roof of your mouth, or use your tongue. And this is the back part of the roof of your mouth. So not the front bit right behind your teeth, but the back bit by your molars. Mm. Um, and there's kind of a little lump there. And this is known in linguistics as the palate. And there's a whole bunch of sounds that involve the palate and involve some sort of constriction at the palate, the back part of the roof of your mouth. It's a big chunk of space. You've got that soft bit further towards the back that you might not want to prod if you have a sensitive gag <laughs> reflex. <laughs> And you yeah, that we don't hard, advise that. Hard bit closer to the teeth. So there's like there's a lot of space to play with there. Yeah, so there's a lot of space and like you can drop your jaw and like let a lot of space happen there. And what's crucial about the palate is it's a space where you can make both vowels and consonants. So you can make an e sound and your tongue will be towards your palate. You can make a y sound and your tongue will be towards your palate. You can make a sh sound and your tongue will be towards your palate. I'm just sitting here quietly going shh, shh, shh to myself. I was teaching a room full of interlinguistic students about the palate, and I was saying, okay, we're going to make a distinction between where S is produced, which is towards the front of the roof of your mouth, and we don't call that the palate. We use the palate just to refer to the back part of the roof of your mouth, and the sh sound, which is on the palate or, or near the palate. And so I was getting the room to say sss, shh, 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 back and forth, and then I was like... You guys thought you were enrolled in interlinguistics, but you're actually enrolled in interparcel tongue. <laughs> the very shy sounds of the snake language of Harry Potter for the three of you out there who aren't familiar. 
if you don't feel like making these sounds or you want to kind of see what other people's tongues are doing, as always with these episodes, I'm linking you to one of my favorite websites, which is where they stuck a bunch of phoneticians in an MRI machine and you can see their tongues doing all these things if you just click on the column of sounds called palatals. That's great. I like that website so much. So the palatals and the j sound, j, is also kind of towards the palatals. At least it's a lot more similar to the palatals than k and g. In contrast, k and g are made a bit further back from the palate, closer towards the back of the mouth. So if you're just thinking about these palatal sounds, the thing is that because there are both vowels and consonants that can be palatal, when you have a vowel that's produced near the palate and a consonant near it, the vowel tends to kind of attract the consonant and make it more palatal and make it more similar to each other because humans like to be efficient about these things. Even if you don't remember any terminology, and you certainly don't have to, the takeaway here is that our mouths are very good at being lazy. (laughs) Uh, and they will strive to do as little moving as possible. It's like, if I'm already there for the vowel, why am I taking myself all the way to the back of the palate? I'm just going to hang here. I'm always happy to celebrate laziness. (laughs) So these palatal vowels, these vowels that are produced near the palate, tend to pull certain consonants with them. And this is what happened to the k and the g sound. And it didn't necessarily happen the same way in all the different languages that descend from Latin. Right. So in French, which is probably the most familiar to English because we borrowed a lot of words from French. So sometimes you have k becoming s in English from Latin. Sometimes you have it becoming ch in English from Latin. So you have things like cassius becoming cheese, but also something like circus becoming circus. So all those k's get pulled more towards the roof of the mouth. But only if the vowel is kind of luring them there, right? So if the vowel isn't kind of near that palatal bit, if the vowel is already kind of back where the k is, then it just stays there. Yeah, so that's the thing. So in a word like circus, the k is before an i, which was pronounced e, circus, whereas the second c is before a u, and that one stays circus, not circus. I like how I'm like, circus sounds completely normal. Circus <laughs> sounds very wrong. Well. Yeah. Circus is just like, no, that, that, that didn't happen. So E and A, which became I and E in English, are the ones that tend to pull the consonants towards them, whereas U and O and A are the ones that let the consonants stay where they want to be. Which solves a mystery of, I mean, spelling bees are entirely mysterious to me, as I think we've established. <laughs> but it solves that mystery of spelling bees because I was always like, why would you ask Because you can ask in a spelling bee the origin of a word. Mm. And so if you ask, like, I have to spell the word circus, please, spelling bee master, tell me the origin of the word. If I know it's a Latin word, I'm like, well, that means it probably is C-I and not K-I, because originally it was probably circus. Yeah, because you don't have K's in Latinate words because all of their C's changed when they were in front of an I or an E. Yeah. This also explains why there's some disagreement about how to pronounce the word Celtic. Ah, oh, yeah. There's a really great post by Stan Carey that goes into the history of this. But I, I don't know. I have to think really hard if I say Celtic or Celtic. But I think I say Celtic. I definitely say Celtic. But there's some like sports team that's correctly pronounced Celtic because that's what people say when they talk about the sports team. Right. And I've definitely heard people say Celtic. And this is one of those ones where if you're obeying the Latinate rules, you're like, well, C-E, that must mean that the C is pronounced like an S. And yet, because when Irish and Scottish Gaelics borrowed the Latin alphabet, it also hadn't had this sound change happen yet. All the Cs were still pronounced like K. So all of the Cs in Gaelic are hard. And so Celt is there's no K in Gaelic. So the C's are all pronounced K. Right. So if you if you use the Gaelic pronunciation, but then it's then it's Celt. But if you're looking at it and you're like, well, but I thought my rule was the C gets pronounced like S, then it's Celt. Which brings us to another major scandal in terms of how words are pronounced, which is, of course, the word that I say as gibberish. <laughs> And the word that I said on a previous episode as gibberish, because I don't know why not say it that way. 
Yeah, I, to be honest, had not paid much attention to your pronunciation, but we had quite a few people draw attention to the fact that we have different pronunciations for this word. Yeah, and this is the same thing like with GIF and JIF, where with... <laughs> which is definitely not a major argument at all. <laughs> no, no one, no one cares about that one on the internet. I've never heard no. any argumentation about it. So with the G's, when we get a word from French or from Latin or from Italian or sometimes from Spanish, but generally Spanish does its own thing, we tend to pronounce that G as a J or a J, like in rouge. But when we get it from a different language we often pronounce it as a G instead. Yeah. And so, of course, when we get it from an acronym, like with GIF, all bets are off, really. And there's no kind of statistical bias in either direction. We have been talking exclusively about C and G, but they are not the only letters that cause me grief with spelling, which is fundamentally about palatalization. There are other sounds in English that are also very attracted to the palate. Yeah, and these are both T and D, T and D, and S and Z, or S and Z. And they're pronounced more towards the front of the palate. But again, if they're in front of an E or an E sound, they tend to get pulled back towards the palate instead of pulled forward. They all get pulled towards the center of the mouth. Palate is like the black hole at the center of the mouth universe. It's got gravity pulling <laughs> everything towards it. Yeah, it's a very attractive place. I think it's also kind of a very easy place to say because it's just right there in the middle. So, like, it could be anything. You don't have to go to a lot of effort to make it happen. Yeah, the tongue is just kind of going straight up from its neutral spot. So what kind of examples do we see with these letters? So there's some ones that are really old that are embedded into English spelling. Words like station and ratio with that T-I-O-N ending. And they were at one point pronounced like station and ratio. Again, would have made spelling tests a lot easier. Way easier. Ratio. Like the, the Romans said this, but ratio, io, gets shortened into ratio or station and eventually gets station and ratio and other words like that. And then there's also some that are super new, and they're not even reflected in standard English spelling. They're only in representations of informal speech. And that's words like did ya? As in, did you find out any good facts about palatalization? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. So if you have did and you, well, you can become ya, obviously. And then that ya sound, the y at the beginning, it's also palatal, so it can pull the d towards it. Did ya? I went to a really great restaurant when I was in New York City a couple months ago, which was pointed out to me by someone on Twitter as like a linguistically interesting restaurant that I should go to. <laughs> <laughs> and it is called Jeet Jet. Jeet Jet. Jeet Jet. Spelled J-E-E-T-J-E-T. -E -E oh, as in, did you eat yet? Yeah. <laughs> Jeet Jet. Jeet Jet. <laughs> That is great. Everything is just collapsing into the palatal center. It's so palatal. It's a palatal palace of food. This is why we're not a food podcast. <laughs> Every so often, when I used to mark linguistics papers for, you know, intro linguistics, you get somebody who would write, instead of palatal, they'd write palatial. Would you draw a little palace? <laughs> and so it's like, it's a little palace. But also, like, why is it not palatial? Because palatial is actually the palatalized version of palatal. It makes sense. We might have to let the language kick on for another couple of centuries to let that process happen. What's really cool about palatals is that they keep going with the trajectories of the language. So in French and Italian, the C's and G's became J and J and Sh and s, and that's pretty well established. In Spanish, they did this other thing. So the Spanish C in front of E or I went to th in Spain, like cerveza, and to s in South America, like cerveza. And the J and G, and also the X, they're now like a h sound, like in Javier. But they stopped for a while at a sh sound. So for a while, this X in Spanish was pronounced sh. Hmm. Just hung out there for a while. Yeah. You can kind of see that trajectory happening. And it happened at a very specific point in Spanish history because this point when X was being pronounced sh 
also happened right around when the Spanish conquerors were first coming in contact with Nahuatl speakers in Central America. Mm -hmm. And so in Nahuatl, there was a sound sh. And so the Spanish speakers were like, well, we have a letter to represent sh. It's an X. We're going to use the X to represent sh like we do in our own language. And so they transcribe certain Nahuatl words, like the word Mexico, Mexico, perfectly reasonably. Yeah. But then Spanish kept changing, and not a lot of people spoke Nahuatl, and so Mexico became Mexico. Ah. Because the X sound was shifted from sh to h. And so Mexico, the pronunciation of it just went with it, even though it was meant to be sh. A representation of the Nahuatl word. Ah, oh, there you go. And other languages looked at it, like English, looked at the spelling of this word and said, well, you have an X there. We have an X. We pronounce it X. Here's how we pronounce the X. And this is where we get Mexico. But it's actually an attempt at representing this Nahuatl sound, but then Spanish kind of changed out from under it. It reminds me of um, when Beijing was updated from the older word Peking. So we still have Peking uh -huh. and like Peking duck. Mm -hmm. And you have that K there in the king when it was updated becomes Jing because over the centuries since it was originally written down, palatalization has occurred in Mandarin Chinese. Oh, that's so good. I just thought the Europeans were really incompetent at transcribing I mean, The Europeans things. were pretty incompetent, and I'm sure that was... <laughs> part of the problem. But you actually have that palatalization happening in Mandarin as well. It's not just an Indo-European phenomenon. Oh, so it's, there's just a sound change happening yeah. in Mandarin as well at the same time. That's so good. Yeah. There's also a really interesting historical example of other languages doing palatalization. Because once you can spot palatalization, you can find it everywhere. It's in so many languages. I'd be honestly more surprised to find a language that had never done any sort of palatalization that hadn't done it than I would be surprised to find it in another language. So the Bantu languages, which are spoken in a wide swath of Africa, they have a set of prefixes that go at the beginning of certain nouns and verbs to indicate which category the nouns belong to, in a very, very simple <laughs> explanation of that. Mm -hmm. And one of these prefixes is used before a noun to make it the language related to that noun. Right. So you have things like in the Congo, the language that's spoken is Kikongo. Yep. In Rwanda, the language that's spoken is Kinyarwanda. In Botswana, the language that's spoken is Setswana. And what's really interesting here is that this prefix, you can tell it's started out as ki, but in some languages it's become chi or shi or si or se. And you can tell that's because this palatal vowel has brought it more towards the vowel. So you have kiswahili, but isizulu hmm. or isikosa or chivenda. And so some of them still have the key, some of them have changed it to C or Chi. So you can see this relationship because they all have the same prefix, but it's changed differently because the sound changes have happened differently in the different languages. Exactly the same set of changes as we get with our cheeses of Europe. <laughs> the same cheese changes. I have a very vivid memory about when I first learned about palatalization. And this was when I went to Scottish Gaelic summer camp when I was like 10 or 12. The thing is, we don't have summer camps in Australia, so I find all summer camps mysterious. I'm like, of course you went on summer camp for Gaelic. Like, that's that weird thing that North Americans do. They, they go on summer camp. It is not very common to go on summer camp for Gaelic. <laughs> Most okay, people... Right. Most of the other kids that were there were there to learn, like, fiddle or step dance or something, which is still fairly rare. Most people go, like, canoeing or something. Okay. But I was a budding linguist, and I wanted to learn Gaelic. So when I was learning Gaelic, they told me about this distinction between broad vowels and slender vowels. And this is super important in Gaelic and in Irish as well, because a whole bunch of consonants in Gaelic change the way they're pronounced depending on which vowels they're next to. Right. And so you end up with all these silent vowels where the vowel itself is silent, but it's just being used to tell you how to pronounce the consonant that it's next to. This is a bit like when I realized the reason you don't hear in Spanish or in English the word guitar, you don't hear that you is because Spanish uses you in the same way there to indicate that it should be a g and not a jita. Exactly. I mean, it's the same you that's in like Guillaume. Yeah to indicate that that is a g, or in guerre, guerra, guerrilla for war. 
yeah, it was a complete revelation for me when I was like, oh, I'm not meant to, like, the U is just there to help me, not to hinder me. <laughs> yeah, it's to help you according to a completely different system that you only understand incompletely. Yeah. And this is the same thing for Gaelic, is that if you have a word like falche, which is the word for welcome, and the last two letters are T-E, the way you know that that T is pronounced like a ch is because there's an E next to it. Or if you have names like Sean or Sinead or Siobhan, the way that you know that that S is pronounced like a sh is because it has an E or an I next to it. Just like, come with me towards the palate. This is the kind of thing that they teach you in like Gaelic 101. They're like, here's the broad vowels, here's the slender vowels, here's why they're so important, because they tell you what how to do this with all your consonants. And yet afterwards, I was like, but English also kind of does this, because if you have a word like circus, the way that you know how each of the C's is pronounced is based on the same distinction between what Gaelic traditionally calls broad and slender vowels, but we can call, you know, palatal or non-palatal vowels. Hmm. The slender vowels in Gaelic are the same thing as a palatal vowel or a front vowel, in to use the proper linguistic term. All of those are the same class of things that all cause the same types of sound changes. And the broad vowels or the non-palatal vowels or the back vowels are all the same category of stuff that doesn't cause this sound change. And this totally rocked my world when I figured it out the first time. <laughs> so I think the thing is, given my general spelling issues, even though I, I have trouble with spelling, I really appreciate that palatalization makes pronouncing things easier. And in many ways, it's really great that the writing system we have kind of captures this history of how these sounds were all the way back to Latin, all the way back to our friend Spurious, and, and they're there to help us. Yeah, it makes certain connections easier to see. You know, like a word like electric, electricity, the C is still there, and when you add an I onto it with the itty ending, you can see it change pronunciation, but you can see the connections between those words more straightforwardly. Whereas if there was a K at the end, you wouldn't necessarily know that it was one that was going to change its pronunciation if an I was added to it. I think what fascinates me about palatalization is it's one of the ways in which linguistics lets us kind of peer deeply into the soul of a language or into the history of a language and into the connections between languages and let us think of these things that we think of as messy and anomalous as actually a unified part of our shared anatomy across all of the spoken languages that we have this in common, which is that we all find it easier to pronounce things in this certain area of our mouths the same. And that makes us part of this really big human story in what seems to be just annoying ways to spell things. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. We're also now on Spotify, so if you use that, you can find us there. You can follow us at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. And you can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include hyperforeignisms, multilingual babies, homonyms, and how to have a good time at academic conferences. And you could help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Especially this month, we're doing our special anniversary round to help the show grow. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producers are A.E. Prevost and Sarah Dopierella. And our editorial manager is Emily Greff. Our production assistants are Celine Yoon and Fabian Anderberg. Our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic. <laughs>